So, good afternoon, everybody. Amen. It's so glad to be with you. I have been to Doncaster before, but now I can see you, all of you in one place. So, such a joy and privilege. Uh, I want you to notice some rhythm in the life of Jesus. In Luke 6, uh, verses uh, 12 to 19, that we read for our scripture reading. Jesus one day went to a mountainside. What did he do there? He prayed. He spent the night praying to God. And then, when the morning came, he called his disciples to him, chose 12 that he called the apostles, and then he went down with them and stood in a level place, and a large crowd of disciples were there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal regions, they all came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Can you see certain rhythm in the ministry of Jesus? It describes just an ordinary day in the life of Jesus, but there is a certain pattern. It starts with solitude. So Jesus is alone, spending time in prayer. And then in the morning he appoints his apostles, his twelve disciples. So it starts with solitude, and then he builds community. And then, after he has the twelve disciples, they go to a level place and they face the world. And they do some ministry all together. So, here is what we can see. Solitude, what's the purpose of that? To develop, what's the first duty of a human being? Love God. Then comes the community, loving people. And then comes ministry. What's the point of loving God and loving other people? To serve the world. Serve the world. So, if you want your relationship with God to flourish, there are certain things you cannot do in a crowd. Okay. Before pandemic, I used to travel 120 days a year. So thank God for pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have been married for 38 years. Amen. If I want our relationship with my wife to flourish, if I travel all the time, it's not going to happen. There are certain things that we need to do together. And that's why I have a room. If I go by car, we always go together. Okay. Next week I will be in Helsinki. I have to fly. I will be alone the whole weekend for the area day of fellowship. But Wakefield, if you go by car, we go together. <coughs> there are certain things that if you want your relationship with God to flourish, it's between you and the Lord. But then, you do something in community with others. And so, I want to concentrate this morning on this middle part. This afternoon, we'll look at the ministry, serving the world. But this morning, I mean, the topic there is for the afternoon. This morning, I want to ask the question, <coughs> why is that important? What do these disciples add to the ministry of Jesus? Why did he call them? Do they bring any value to him? Most of them did not get what he was trying to teach them. They argued all the time. The number one debate was who is the greatest, which was so contrary to his spirit. Two of them asked if they could sit on his right hand and the left hand in his kingdom. When the other ten heard about it, they got so upset that it started another fight. They tried to keep children away from Jesus when Jesus wanted to see them. They promised to be with Jesus in his hour, in his greatest need, in the hour of his greatest need. 
But when the trial came, they all ran away. When Jesus told them, stay awake and pray, they all went to sleep. When Jesus was asleep, uh, when Jesus was asleep in a boat, they wake him up and said, it's time to pray. <laughs> in Luke 9, they go to a Samaritan village and they feel they are not certainly welcoming to him as they should. And so they ask, should we call fire down from heaven to kill all these Samaritans? And Jesus said, no. Next time they say to him, we saw a man who was casting out demons in your name, but we didn't like it, so we tried to stop him. Did we do good? No. Was it right? No. Jesus said no. I mean, where did Jesus get these guys? <laughs> Thomas was a doubter, Judas was a thief, Levi was a tax collector working for Romans, Peter cut off guy's ear. Why did Jesus name these people? Now, solitude, that makes sense to me. You have to do certain things with your God. Changing the world, yes, that makes sense to me. But why Jesus invest in these people? And of course, the answer is love. Love, rightly understood. As the Bible says, love your God as you with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Now what, what was it a new commandment? No, oh, they heard it already in Torah, they are supposed to love God and love your neighbor. But what is new? As Jesus loved you. As I love you. So you must love one another. What is new here is, as I have accepted you, as I have invested in you, you need to show that to other people as well. In other words, Jesus says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, how? that you will be the most loving people in the world. Somebody should say amen. 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 Yeah. Because Jesus doesn't say, you guys need to be the smartest, yeah. the richest, the prettiest people in the world. No. He says, I will be happy if you are just the most loving people. I am betting all on this. Everybody will know that you belong to me. You will carry my signature. If people look at you and say, these are the most loving people I have ever seen, mm -hmm. then my community will be unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Then you can serve the world and change the world. Mm -hmm. When? Amen. When you love one another. So what does it mean to love one another? How does it express? itself. Now I want you to know for the rest of the sermon we are going to talk about this card that everybody in the early church was carrying around their neck. And what was the message? Everybody is welcome. In this community everybody is welcome. Now you need to understand this was not common. This was not normal in the world in which they lived. Jesus got into trouble because he welcomed everybody. He was nice even to Gentiles, to Samaritans, to tax collectors, to prostitutes, to lepers, to sinners, to Romans, centurions, even those who were regarded sinners or oppressors, he was nice to all of them. So nice that people said, these men will come sinners and eat with them. And let me tell you, that was not considered a compliment. That was an insult. 
this guy cannot be from God because he will come second. And Jesus says, that's right. Everybody is welcome. Everybody is loved. Everybody is accepted. Everybody can be embraced. Everybody must be included. And his disciples didn't get it. They were scandalized by that. They were put off. They were confused by that. But later, when the Holy Spirit came, they created a new community. A place that never existed before, where everybody carried a sign around their neck. In this community, everybody is welcome. In every society, there are people on the margins. People who we don't have much space for. And in ancient days, such people were slaves. They were abused. They were bought and sold. They could be punished however the master wanted to. When they got sick or useless, you just kill them. It's like when you break your jar or a cup. Nobody's going to say, what are you doing? It's your cup. You buy a new one. <laughs> Nobody thought much about slaves. You know what one of the wisest men of the ancient world said? Have you, have you seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Yeah. Yes. The father of the bride says to his soon-to-be son-in-law, the American, <coughs> when you Americans have been chasing buffaloes, we Greeks already had philosophers. <laughs> you know what Aristotle said? All those who are not born Greeks by nature are born to be slaves. That's what people thought in those days. But there was a group, there was a little community who remembered that their master knelt down and washed the feet of his disciples. He did the work of a slave. And he said that in this community, people who are like slaves, people who serve, are the greatest of all. And so they remembered it. And they treated slaves differently. Because they had a message around their neck. In this community, everybody is welcome. Now, there is a guy whose name was Aristides. He lived in 140 AD. He was a historian. And this is what he says about Christians. Any slaves that they may have among them, that is among Christians, they persuade to become Christians because of the love, of the love that they show towards them. These slaves in this Christian community where everybody was welcome, become brothers without discrimination. Because in the ancient world nobody likes slaves except the followers of Jesus. There was a narrow community like this before, where even slaves are not. One of the politicians was a governor. His name, what is today known as Turkey, his name was Pliny the Younger. He had a famous, uh, he was a nephew of a famous guy who was called Pliny the Elder. By the way, do you know how his little boy was named? Pliny the Tiny. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Just to make sure you don't fall asleep. Around 100 AD, he writes to the emperor. Trajan was the emperor at that time. We have a document that was found he was quite upset because he was a bureaucrat, he was a governor in one of the administrative structures in Turkey, and he writes to the emperor, these Christians are spreading all over the place. And he didn't like it, but he didn't know what these Christians are all about. He didn't like the fact that these Christians would not bow down to the emperor. And so he wanted to find out who are these Christians. 
And so what he did is that he got two Christians arrested and tortured. They were women and they were slaves. And he knew that he's going to get away with it because they were women and they were slaves, so he could torture them without any consequences. And he discovered not only they are Christians, they were deaconesses. They had a position in this community. Why? Because in the body of Jesus, everybody is. Everybody is. And so he writes to his boss. Many persons of every age, every status, and also of both sexes are at risk of joining the church. This contagion, this is how he calls the violent Christians, this virus has spread not only to cities but to villages and farms. But if we do something about it, it's still possible to check it and to cure it, get rid of it. Now, around 100 AD, when he writes from Turkey, there were about 50,000 Christians, according to historians in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at that time had 60 million people, so a little bit less than the UK. 60 million people in all of the Roman Empire. And there are 50,000 Christians, 80 years, 70, 80 years after the death of Jesus. We can stop it, he says. But these Christians are different because they treat even slaves differently. And not only they treated slaves differently, they treated poor people differently. Why? Because they remember their master said in Luke 6, 21, blessed are the poor. One day a rich guy came to Jesus and Jesus said, this is so terrific. Mm -hmm. I am so glad you want to follow me. I will put you on the conference executive committee. <laughs> right? No. He said to him, go, give away everything that you've got, sell it all, give the money to the poor, and then you can come and follow me. You don't treat people with resources like that. But Jesus was different. Remember, he was from a poor family. And the Christians carried a sign around their neck. In this movement, everybody is welcome. One day, an emperor who was called Julian the Apostate. Why well, he was called the apostate? Because he opposed Christianity. He writes this. When the poor were all overlooked by our priests, that is the Roman pagan priests, this impious, this wicked, why do they, he calls them impious Galileans? Because they oppose him as an emperor. They say, emperor is not the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. So he calls them impious. They are not pious people in his eyes. So when, our, when the poor were overlooked by our Roman pagan priests, these impious Galileans noticed how the poor were being overlooked. And what did they do? They devoted themselves to helping them. And this bothers Julian, the emperor. Why these Christians devote themselves to benevolence, being a blessing and support for the poor? Not only they were poor, but they cared about other poor people. But why did they do it? Because everybody in that community carried a sign. Everybody. In this community, everybody's welcome. Thank you. And not only they treated like they slaves and the poor, they also treated like this children. There is a Norwegian theologian, his name is Odd Magnet Bakke. Don't you think these Norwegians have odd names? 
and he writes, when age, in ancient world there was no clear conception of childhood as we had now, and therefore violence, infanticide, or letting the little small children die, leaving them to die of exposure if it was not wanted because of its gender. Do you know there is a Jewish apocryphal book which says to have daughters is a great disadvantage. Aren't you glad it's not in the Bible? Because it's danger or poverty or because it was sickly, because they think it will not survive, they just put it outside the door and let it die. <clears throat> Sexual exploitation of children was not just present, it was different. considered as a part of the culture. People talked about it openly. 50% of children in the Roman Empire died before the age of 10. Before children got to be 10 years old, half of them were dead because of how they were treated. But this community remembered that their rabbi said, let little children come to me. He took them on his hands, he blessed them. And because in this community, everybody was welcome, they welcomed children as well. They wrote books how to treat little children, how to raise them so that they become part of the community. They love children. Do you know the title of his dissertation, his Norwegian theologian? When children, small children, became people, the birth of childhood thanks to early Christianity. They came with the idea that childhood is supposed to be a happy period. They are also important because everybody's gone. And not only the Christians treated like this, slaves, the poor, and children, they also treated like this, sick people. It's hard for us to imagine because in this world there was no medicine, no sanitation, no hygiene, soap did not exist. They lived in crowded conditions. When the disease came, it would wipe out one third, one half of population. Remember what the pandemic did in Britain? Now imagine if 20 million people died in the UK. Imagine if 35 million people died because of the pandemic. Now that's what happened in 165, in 250. Every 100 years or so, a plague would go through the Roman Empire and wipe out 25 to 50 percent of people. And one historian writes that the first onset of the disease, of the plague, they, that is the general population, pushed the sufferers away and they fled from their dearest, you know, spouse from the spouse, parents from their children, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpses as dirt. That was the world. This is how they behaved. But because Christians remember that in this community everybody is welcome, they took care of the sick people. They ministered to them. And they took care not only of the sick people of the community, they took care of the sick people of the society. And people laughed at them and they said, that's it. That will wipe you out. And you know what happened? They survived. Yes, many of them died. Let's not romanticize their early church. They were not perfect. They had lots of divisions, lots of problems. But they were a place where everybody was known. They treated even the sick people with dignity and health. There is a study that was made in Alameda County, it's part of San Francisco, 
where they took 7,000 people in California and followed them for nine years. You know what they discovered? They discovered that people who were isolated, who did not have connections and relationships with others, were more likely, three times more likely to die than people with strong relational connections. Now, researchers were surprised that people with bad health habits, people who were smoking, poor eating habits, no exercise, used alcohol, and so on, but had strong relational social ties, they live significantly longer than people with great health habits, jogging, eating properly, yet living in an isolated way, not connecting with anyone. Let me translate that for you. It's better to eat chocolate with friends than broccoli alone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry, but that's the only thing most of you will remember from this. <laughs> you know, I was in the church and the pastor said, it's broccoli. better to eat Kit Kat with friends than broccoli alone. No, what was the message? <laughs> and that's how they treated it. They became irresistible. Now, here's the question for you and me. Do you think the Holy Spirit has lost the power? No. Do you think that God still can do that today? Yes. Do you think that there still can be in Wakefield, in Doncaster, in Chesterfield, a community where everybody says, we don't care what is your race, where you come from ethnically, where you come from culturally, where you are economically, where you stand morally, generationally, because in this community, everybody is welcome. And if we are not a community like that, do you think that Jesus is eager to help us to be a place where everybody is welcome? And that's the problem. In the early Christianity, they carry the sign. Nobody's Nobody perfect. They believe that we are all sinners. We all sin. At the foot of the cross, the ground is left. We all stand in the need of God's forgiveness. And that's why this community overcame the usual dynamics that are part of other human communities. They try to get rid of hiding, of pretending, reputation building, trying to impress everybody around you. Because they knew we are all sinners living by grace. Nobody's perfect. And that's why Jesus says, do not judge so that you, too, will not be judged. Try to understand why people think, behave in a certain way. Do not look at them that I am up here, you are down there. Can't you just try a little bit harder to come at least to my level? Not in my community, because we realize we are all struggling with something. We are in a community where nobody, nobody has it all together. We are all struggling with something. In this community, there won't be this attitude, I am superior, you are inferior. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, 6. How are we doing that one? Do you realize there are people who act, who wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with their spirituality. It has to do with how they are wired. German mathematician Gauss 
came with the idea that human society can be plotted uh, or presented as a bell curve. 100% of population is always on a bell curve. Now, there are those who are on one end of the bell curve and they are risk takers. There are people who do not experience anxiety. And today we know from science it has to do with GABA. Gamma amino butyric acid in your system. And if you have a high level of gamma amino butyric acid in your system, you are less susceptible to adrenaline. And that's why you do not experience anxiety. That's why you need to do skydiving, bungee cord jumping, race driving just to give you a feeling that you are alive. <laughs> because normal life does not excite you. There is no risk in that. And there are other people on the other side of the bell curve for whom to go to a party, to give a speech in front of people, creates a lot of anxiety. Now it's easy to come and to say, how come that you experience anxiety? Because I don't. That means you are not spiritual enough. You do not pray hard enough. You do not read long enough. No. In the community of Jesus, but he's perfect. We are all wired differently. That's why we do not judge one another. Because I don't know how you are. You know how Americans say it? The floor of one is the ceiling of another one. Yes. I remember one of the first church boards that I led as a young pastor. One elder exploded. He didn't like what we were discussing, and somebody proposed something, and he didn't like it, and he said, No way, and if this happens, I, I and mean, he just walked out. And the other guy looked at him and said, Man, you should handle your temper in a better way. And the guy from the door looked back at him and said, I have overcome more temper in my life than you ever had. And I thought, stay with me all those 30 plus years. God, the floor of one is the ceiling of another. We are not the same. And that's why in the body of Christ, everybody's welcome. And nobody is judged because they are perfect. If we encounter sin, we are going to confess it. But we are not going to judge anyone. There were two sisters, Myers and Briggs, and they said that some people are wired in such a way that other people deplete your batteries and you don't need to be around them very much. And other people suffer in the lockdown because other people charge their batteries. Now it's not talkative and less talkative, it's what do other people do to your batteries? Do they train them or do they charge them? Some people, according to these two sisters, use intuition, other people use their senses. Other people process through rational, other people we process through their emotions. Now, other people like to have things in places, in filing cabinet, other people have it all, all around them and they don't need to be clear cut, black and white. Now, this doesn't man mean judgmental, this does not mean perceived, perceptive, it's just how do you like things to be? Do you need things clear cut, black and white? Or can you live with the fact that sometimes it's like this? <laughs> if, yet, if you do, then you are a P. If you can't, then you are a J. Because we are all wired differently. And everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome. Everybody's perfect. Everybody's perfect. And because of that, and because of the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work, 
the last message that the early church carried was change is possible. Jesus looks at those who nailed him to the cross and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are. Instead of saying to hell with all of you, blasting them and saying, guys, it's about time to discover who are you treating like this. I have all the power of the universe. And if Jesus wanted, he could then wipe them all out. He sees that one day these people who are around the cross, mistreating him, will be the future members of this new community. He sees that they can change. They can be in that new community. And that's why the Bible ends with the words, Come, that all who hear say, Come, those who are thirsty, come. Come, come taste the waters of life without price. It's available for everybody. Because remember, in the body of Christ, everyone is Amen. Amen. Amen.